Good evening, everyone. We are coming to a very major chapter in the book of First Samuel, and we are now in chapter fifteen. Chapter fifteen. Now, when it comes to this word "then," uh, usually I would tell you that it is "and then," meaning after chapter fourteen at the end. We don't know how long, but it is shortly thereafter, in chapter fourteen, something major takes place in chapter fifteen. Now it's a it's a chapter that many of us would have read many times, but today we are going to look at the Hebrew to actually understand this a little bit more than what the English is actually saying. So let's begin. With chapter fifteen, verse one, take note of who is speaking to who. Samuel said to Saul. So understand that conversation is taking place in this manner. And as Samuel begins that conversation, he is saying this: "The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over His people, over Israel." Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Now, there is a lot of important verbs that is located here. Number one, sent. This word "sent" is used in very special ways in the in the Oriental culture. Ah,、uh, they talk about sending as sending one to rep. Present the sender. Now, obviously, in ancient China,、uh, the emperor would send, and that's the same word to send to shalach, to send one as an emissary or a messenger to a faraway land and brings a message, which is called the imperial edict. The Sengzi, as it said in in, in Cantonese,、uh, and basically for all intents and purposes, the one who is sent、uh, bears the full authority of the emperor. And so, when we read it here, and we see that God, Jehovah, and He is the sender, and He is sending. Samuel, and that idea of anointing, smearing of of oil to use Saul, and anointing actually takes place for two particular roles. One is for the priesthood.、Uh, two as king. So whenever you see the king being anointed, this is a ritual. To present the king as one that God has accepted into this particular role, and king means one who will reign, who will take authority or take dominion over God's people. Notice what has happened. It used to be God and Israel. Right, and now it has become God, King, and then Israel. And so, what's going to happen is God is transferring the authority to the King, and by doing this, the ritual of anointing officially affirms and confirms Saul. Over Israel, his people, and so God's people remain as God's people, right? It is still God's people, and now we have a a one who has dominion by proxy. I would say, so the king rules on behalf of God. Over his people, because that was what the people demanded of God, or、uh, through Samuel, and so Samuel is now the one sent. 
Saul is the king who is ruling by proxy, and it is his people over Israel, and this is an A and a B. His people is Israel. And so the statement in chapter 15, verse 1, is an attention. Therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Now, there are a couple of words that's missing here. So let me just give it to you. Listen to, uh, to the sound of the words of the Lord. And so we have missing in the text the sound of. Uh, because when you talk about listening, you know, it's it's like picking up the sounds uh, and then to understand and then to make a decision to follow it. And so this whole picture is a very imagery-driven sentence. To listen, open up your ears to listen to the sound. Because when God speaks through Samuel, uh, it comes out as words or the issues, but the issues comes out as sounds. The voice of God is speaking through the lips of Samuel. So remember, the one to represent the sender as Samuel is to utter the words of God and the, the sound that comes out of Samuel's mouth is actually now understood as the sound of the words of the Lord. So understand, the concept of sending is very powerful in the Hebrew context, very similar to ancient China. And the king reigning also is very interesting because it is also a very oriental concept. And the king represents God in ruling, in the dominion over the people, and that people belongs to God. And so the king always has to remember he is sitting in the middle, that he has to listen to God, and he has to take the directions of God to represent God to the people. And if the king misrepresents the character of God, well, God will get really angry, isn't it? And so that is the prelude to the rest of this chapter so that we understand the idea of sending, the idea of anointing as king, and the idea of listening is to pick up the sounds of the words of the Lord. And that in itself is very, very important. Now with this, we shall begin in detail, moving on to verse 2 and onwards. Now in verse Two, thus says the Lord of hosts. This is to tell uh, Saul that Samuel is speaking, but the speech is about the voice of the words of God. And so the voice or the sound that Saul is hearing is Samuel's mouth, right? His lips are moving. And Samuel is saying, listen to the sound that's coming out of my mouth. Those sounds are the words of God. That is the, the intent of 15 verse 2. Now it begins by using this phrase, the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is Yehovah Tzvaot. This is a name that, is, that God uses when he goes to war which means that a battle is coming up. And so God says, I will punish Amalek. Right? I will punish uh, Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Uh, let's, let's break this down a little bit before we go to verse 3. Lord of hosts, battle name, 
right? Battle name, which tells us or hints to us that something is going to happen. And it says, go. And God says that uh, I will miss. And the word is pakat. Now, you, we've seen this before, right? Pakat. Now, pakat has a number of interesting words. Pakat means to visit. Now, we will understand that this word visit or pakat was used in Exodus chapter 20. And I will visit your descendants to the third and fourth generation. And that means God will appear to punish. And that's what it means to visit. So visit is a nice term. I come and pay you a visit. But the pain of the visit depends on the context that is used, whether it is for good uh, that will be taking care of you or for evil that will be punishing you. And so God says, I will punish. Pakat. Punish who? Amalek. For what he did. Now, Every time you see Amalek, it's as if that he, God is talking to a person. Well, Amalek was a person, but he is addressing the descendants of Amalek. Uh, what he did to Israel, how he set himself, right? These are all third person words. Against him would be Israel. On the way, on the journey, when he, Israel, was coming up from Egypt. Now, understand, this is geographically this way. We have Egypt is lower than Canaan. That's the picture that we have, right? That's the picture that we have. So now that we have identified all the pronouns, who is he? Well, in the English, we have this he here and he there and himself. And so in context, we need to put together clearly who is talking to who. So this is Amalek. And this is Amalek. So God is talking about how Amalek accosted the Israelites. Now, this particular event is a very memorable event and it's a very important event to remember for us as well for us as well and we should go back to Exodus chapter 17 right Exodus chapter 17 now we are going to leave our screen and we're going to go and look at a couple of things before we come back to chapter 15, verse 3. Uh, the reason I needed to do this is so that we all have the same understanding of the issue of Amalek because it is not expressed in great detail in 1 Samuel chapter 15. But without that background, we will fail to appreciate why God is so angry with Amalek. Now, how do we know that God is angry? Because God is punishing Amalek. God will not punish anyone until God's patience is over. And when God's patience is over, there is no turning back that the action of the punishment will be severe, especially if the actions by the Amalek was done on God's people, that God's chosen nation, God's holy nation, God's loved nation, the beloved of God, the firstborn of God. You know, that All these are descriptions of Israel. And when somebody touches Israel, then you would understand. Yesterday, we were looking at the word Ghana. God is a Ghana God, that he is a jealous God, that he will protect the ones that he loves, but he will also punish the ones he loves with such zeal that Israel can be punished as well. God is a just God. And so we must remember that. 
for God to punish, he is very angry. All right? Very angry. Now you may think, am I making this up? Not at all. If later when we go to 1 Samuel chapter 28, you will see how angry God is when he refers back to 1 Samuel chapter 15. But we will not go to 1 Samuel 28 because when we get there, we will touch on it. I just want to impress on everyone today that it is so important to understand what is behind 1 Samuel chapter 15. Why is God so angry with Amalek? And so let us now go to Exodus chapter 17. The passage that we begin to look at, and we are not going to study the passage. If you want to have a more detailed study, you could check out the YouTube channel on a public uh, series on Exodus. We are particularly looking at Exodus chapter 17, starting from verse 8. Now, the first seven verses is talking about water uh, that, that is uh, in contention, that they have no water and complain to God. Now, come to chapter 17, verse 8. They are at, uh, they are at Rephidim. Rephidim is a place that is slightly off the coast of the Red Sea after they've crossed the Red Sea. And what we have here is the Amalek. And they came to fight with Israel. So what's going to happen is Israel had crossed the Red Sea and came to a place called Rephidim. And that's where we have Israel. And so as this is being, being plotted out for Israel to keep going, the Amalek came and attacked them from behind. And so in that fight, we always remember because there is Moses, there is Joshua, and there is um, her. And so in verse 9, Moses said to Joshua, choose men out, go out to fight. And Joshua led the fight against the Amalek. And Moses said, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And Joshua went out to fight, fought with Amalek. And then three of them, Moses, Aaron, and Hur, went up to the top of the hill. And when it came to pass that Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So you would know the story very, very well. But Moses' hands were heavy, tired. They took a stone and put it under him. He sat on it. Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, means held up his hand. Now this word, uh, held up his hand, is a very important word in chapter 17, verse 12. The word held up his hand uh, was the grass in his hand one here and one there, one on one side, the other on the other side. But the word that I want to point out to you is that his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And this word steady comes from the word emunah, and this is the word for faith. Right? For uh, what else? For firmness. And so the word steady is also another word used for faith, to trust in God, to be firm in God. And so faith is giving us a concept or the imagery of being pegged in, being firm, that you're not movable in whom you trust. And that is faith. Now, after all these, uh, we know that the, the event was over and uh, Israel prevailed. All right? Israel prevailed. Now, the second point I want to make uh, to us today uh, is the understanding of who Amalek really is. And that 
After that, we will go back to verse 3 of 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now we turn to Genesis chapter 36. Genesis chapter 36 and reading from verse 12. And so we need to plot out um, Amalek. And Amalek comes from a background of uh, Esau. So let us read this. And Timna was concubine to uh, Eliphaz, uh, right here, and uh, Eliphaz, his Esau's son. And through her, uh, she bore Amalek. And so what is important is that we have uh, Isaac, and from Isaac, we have Jacob, the younger, but we have Esau that we seldom talk about. Now, Esau uh, had uh, a number of sons, a number of sons, and one of the sons is Eliphaz. Eliphaz has a wife and her name is Timna. And with this, they too had a son. And the son, one of them is called Amalek. This is important, after all, for our purposes so that we understand um, uh, that Amalek is a distant cousin of the Israelites. And Amalek comes from the lineage of Esau. Now, the descendants of Esau, obviously, uh, are the Edomites, right, of Edom. But part of Edom, you get also the Amalek or Amalekites. With Jacob, we have 12 sons, and this becomes Israel. And all stems from Isaac, and Isaac is the only uh, is the son of Abraham. Now, this is the point I want to make with you, is that because he came from Esau or Esau, there was a problem because when Esau got married, he married Canaanite. And one of the wives that Esau had or Esau had was also uh, a daughter of Ishmael. However, what is important for us to recognize in the book of Genesis is that Isaac and Rebekah had wanted their children to marry uh, Semitic people, people who came from the lineage of uh, Shem, Semitic people. And they are actually in the homeland of Haran or the Mesopotamian region. And so Jacob was sent back to Laban. But Esau got married first and that really upset the parents of Isaac and Rebekah. And seeing that happening, they advised Jacob at the age of 40 to go to Laban and marry a wife who are who, who is also from a Semitic uh, descendant. Now, there are a lot of interesting things that we'll read in the book of Genesis, but we'll leave it for another day. But rest assured, we are interested in Amalek, and Amalek is from marriages of Esau that did not appease Isaac and Rebekah. And one of them is Amalek. So let us now return back to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 3. So as we begin with verse 3, you need to bear in mind, number one, God had an instruction given to Saul that he is to hear the voice of the words of the Lord. Number two, God is going to punish Amalek for what he did to Israel uh, and Amalek would have, in Exodus chapter 17, attempted to wipe out Israel. 
they weren't going there to have a party and to say hi to the distant cousin. Amalek was there to destroy Israel, but they couldn't. And Joshua led the army of Israel and prevailed. Now, over the period of time in the book of Judges, uh, later, uh, there, there were a lot of encounters with the Amalekites. Now, at the end of Judges, we are into 1 Samuel, and God wants to deal with first Sam, in 1 Samuel with the Amalekites. Uh, and God says, I will punish. And so this is a delivery of a judgment by God for his anger upon Amalek. And he is choosing Saul as the new king of Israel to test him and to see how he would obey God to carry out the punishment. And so this is the picture. Why? Because the Amalekites had done something of disdain to Israel, trying to wipe out Israel. And so he tells uh, Saul to go and strike Amalek. Uh, the word strike here means to, to slay, right? To slay Amalek. And then you see here the word utterly destroy. This one utterly destroy all that he has. Uh, in verse 3, uh, just observe the instructions. It says to destroy all that he has and him as well. Do not spare him. Right? Do not spare him. And then put to death. Put to death. Uh, the man, the woman, the child, the infant, the ox, the sheep, the camel, the donkey. So let's break this down just a little bit because we need to have clarity before we move on. The first word here is to utterly destroy. Uh, strike and utterly destroy. This word utterly destroy is haram. Haram. We have seen this when we were reading uh, the prophet books, that the, the, the one of the, the, the problems that the Israelites had against the poor, the needy, the orphans and the widows was that they were creating violence, right? Violence against the, the weaker uh, segment of the community. And so if you look at it from a, another viewpoint, the same word is to tell Israel to completely do violence to them, to completely, uh, I, I guess you would say haram has the idea of exterminate. To exterminate, uh, completely destroy. This word utterly is completely. Because God is imposing his judgment on Amalek. He is extremely angry and says, destroy them all. All of them. And all that he has. All that he has. And what does he have? Man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. So all must be destroyed. And this next word, do not spare him. The word do not spare him actually means uh, do not have pity on him. Do not have compassion on him. So do not spare him means he has to go too. And then it says, put to death. The word put to death is cause to die. Cause to die. Cause to perish. What? From the man, the woman, uh, this word child, right? A child or boy. Uh, 
this, these are young children and infants. And this word infant comes from the word suckling. That is still uh, uh, a very, very young kid. Uh, from the ox, the sheep, the camel, and donkey, this is total destruction. Now, God is angry with the nation. And with the nation, God will destroy that nation. Now, we may not be aware, but this there was a, a prophecy in Numbers chapter 24 and in verse 20. And this would be the one of the, the final uh, prophecy that was given by Balaam, Bilam, with regards to the Amaleks, right? The Amalek says they may be the first of the nations. They will be last until they are completely, completely destroyed. So this is the issue here. They are going to be completely destroyed in this instance as a punishment that the violence is to be done on the Amalekites and everybody has to go. Now, there is a phrase in Chinese uh, called zam tou chui gan, that you cut the uh, grass and you remove the roots so that the grass will not grow anymore. And that is this concept. And so 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 3 is not a unique concept. It is a similar concept in ancient oriental culture that when the time comes to exterminate you are not to leave anyone alive because they will come after you and there will never be peace because revenge is the 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 dish that is served by the ones that is left over and so god says to completely wipe them out so that the women will not take vengeance the children would not when they grow up. And all the ox, sheep, camel, and donkey were used for sacrifices of pagan gods. And so they were raised for that purposes. And at the end of the day, God says, I don't want any of them to do with me. And so this is a very strict instruction. In verse 4, it says, Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Salaim. Now, this is a very strange uh, an, uh, occasion. Uh, let me just read this through so that then we will explain what it means. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. So there are a lot, a lot of people, but they're not supposed to do a census. So how did Saul go and count the people? And so this is the key, Tala'im. Tala'im actually means a shelter place, a shelter for lambs. And so what they did was for every soldier, they were to go and take a lamb, right? A lamb. And each lamb will represent one soldier. And so what did they count at the end of the day? They counted lambs. And as they count the lambs, they had 200,000 foot soldiers. And then there were 10,000 Judah, men of Judah. Why was this single out? Because later we will see the connection from Saul, who represents Benjamin, the smallest of tribe, and the transition to David from Judah. And so this was done by Saul, so that he is going to prepare himself for war with the Amalekites. And now he knows what to do. And so verse 5, Saul came to the city of Amalek, set an ambush in the valley. All right? And then Saul said to the 
Kenites. The Kenites apparently were there as well or came by. And uh, this, the Kenites actually uh, appears by name at least as a reference to Cain. So this is called the Kenites. And uh, they were good. And it is told that the Kenites were the descendants of uh, Jethro. Uh, who who seem to be a, a, a priest of the Midianites, all right? Uh, and these were the Kenites, and the uh, and Saul says, "Go depart from among the Amalekites, so that when the Amalekites are destroyed, the Kenites will not be destroyed with them, so that I do not destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when he came out from Egypt." That is why this is said to be understood as the, the, the descendants of Jethro. And so the Kenites, the Canaanites, departed from among the Amalekites so that they are not collateral damage. Verse 7. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah to, uh, to Shur. Havilah to Shur which is east of Egypt. Uh, why east of Egypt? This is far east. In fact, uh, the, 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 how should we say, we, if Egypt was here, it is far east of Egypt to shore. Right? Havilah to shore. And this is going all the way uh, past Syria to the Mesopotamian area, but it is east of Egypt. That entire land that is east of Egypt in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula was the entire battle. And the Amalekites were chased away completely out of the picture until they were all defeated. Next, he says he captured Agag, right? He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, but he utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now, this is the first problem that they had. The problem is Agag was alive. The instruction was do not spare, do not have pity on the king of, Ag uh, of the Amalekites, Agag, right? Agag. Now let's go through verse 9 and then we will go and take a look at another passage uh, and then we will call it a day. Verse 9 says, And Saul and the people spared Aga. Verse 9 says, Spared Aga means have compassion. All right? Pity. Compassion. And God says, do not have compassion. And they had compassion. So this is a big problem, right? It's a big problem because it violated God's instructions. And of course, you can say, Saul and the people spared. Now, of course, the people were there in the fight and the people did not kill Agag, but it was God's instruction to kill everybody. And then the best of the sheep, oxen, and fatlings, the lambs, and all that was dove were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. So what did they do is number two. They had a problem. Aga lives. There were animals. Right? Animals also lived. And so two things, instead of everyone being totally destroyed, yes, they destroy all the people, right? Right here. All the men, women, and children, they destroy. But they left the animals and Agar alive. Now, what is the problem with Agar? Now, I'm going to take us to another chapter uh, in another book so that we would have... Uh, a good understanding of what is going to happen and why God became so angry. Uh, understand, so far, the Amalekites were the ones that wanted to destroy Israel. 
but they failed. They tried many times in the book of Judges. So now God says it's time to destroy them because that is God's anger and judgment poured upon the Amalekites and say, go destroy everyone, including the king, men, women, children, and livestock. But they let Agat live and they let the animals live. Let me now take you to another passage in the book of Esther, and then we will end there because it has something to do with Aga. We start with Esther chapter 3. It says, after these events, um, King Ahash uh, Shurush promoted Haman. Haman was the son of um, Hamadat, or it says here Hamadatta, uh, the Agagite, and advanced him, established his authority over all the princes who were with him. So this word here is important for us. Uh, the Agagite is a descendant. of King Aga. And who do you think King Aga was? And of course, that would be the Amalekites, Amalek. Now, this is an interesting uh, observation here, mainly because Haman eventually got a decree from King Ahasuerus to kill all the Jews in the land in one day. In the, uh, in the 12th month uh, of Adar. And, and in, in, in the twist of events, Mordecai uh, used Esther to approach the king. And you would know the story. You know, if you wanted uh, more details in the study, uh, it is available in the study of Esther in the public channel. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, instead of the Jews being killed, uh, Haman were, and his family were hung. And so that became the end of the entire aspiration of the Amalekites to try to destroy Israel once and for all. And so Haman is the son of Agag, and Agag was left untouched by King Saul. Now, with this, I would leave this for you as a background so that when we get back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, we will have a clearer picture as how the entire story unfolds and transpires and why God became so angry, first with the Amalekites, now and then with Saul and the people. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.